Providing our reply will be Larry Jorgensen from Skidmore College, a response to Rutherford. Okay. Um, there are uh, perhaps at least two separable theses in Rutherford's paper. Uh, the first, uh, I have a great deal of sympathy with uh, as an interpretation of Leibniz. The necessity of grace can be inferred from natural theology alone. Grace operates through the natural order and largely, if not exclusively, via circumstances. Um, questions of detail can be raised about that, but uh, as I say, I'm sympathetic to that. The second, salvation is available to those outside of Christianity, uh, which uh, Rutherford speaks of in the end of his paper. Um, I want to focus some questions on that uh, as well. So in, in uh, my comments, what I will do is uh, focus on a particular text of Leibniz, see how uh, the grace works itself out, particularly in the case of someone outside of the church. I wonder uh, just how consoling that is, and uh, then have a short word about just how Christian uh, all of this is. So, Rutherford argues that the principal importance of the theodicy is as the expression of a distinctive theological outlook and of a particular conception of universal religion, which Leibniz cultivated throughout his career. The evidence he proposes for his claim is certainly telling. Leibniz does say that those who have never heard of Jesus Christ might nevertheless be given a special dispensation of grace, enabling them to attain the state of blessedness. And as Rutherford notes, when Leibniz talks directly about teaching that Jesus Christ is the way to salvation, he is rather cagey. What would be the reason for the caginess on this issue if the audience he wanted to, to appeal to were Christian theologians of various stripes, unless he were holding back uh, on his considered view? And uh, Rutherford argues that Leibniz is in fact masking a deeper view, the view that the true religion is a universal religion and that salvation can be attained without any reference to Jesus Christ. And indeed, there is evidence from outside the theodicy that Leibniz held this view. Also, in the New Essays, Leibniz says that what is so good and comforting for mankind is the fact that to be in the state of God's grace, one needs only to have sincerely and seriously a good will. There's no reference to the church or to the knowledge of Christ here, and indeed Leibniz goes on to say, it's impossible that God should have set an easier or more reasonable condition than to have a good will. So in what follows, I'd like to first propose a, a problem for this interpretation and then look at a particular text where Leibniz assembles the resources to respond to this problem. And by considering the objection, we'll see how the, uh, Rutherford's interpretation can be developed in interesting ways. Um, first, the problem. In short, it's not clear that Leibniz is justified in believing that efficient grace will be conferred to the pagans. Rutherford's analysis of grace and circumstances provides a fully general and natural account of grace, and this, it seems, would apply equally to pagans and Christians alike. Any individual might find themselves in favorable circumstances. However, what you can't infer from natural theology alone is an account of precisely what circumstances are necessary to the development of a good will and it is open to Leibniz's detractors to say that the revelation of Jesus Christ is one of the necessary conditions. So according to this objection, while the account of grace is fully general, it turns out that one necessary part of the circumstances leading to the development of a good will is particular to the Christian church, and we aren't justified in believing that the necessary grace will be extended to those outside of the church. Okay, so that's the objection. Now, Leibniz, uh, uh, I think, has a response to this. Uh, and uh, I want to look in particular at section 283 um, and uh, see how he works this out. So I'll read this. It's a lengthy quote. It, um, in the dogmas themselves held by the disciples of St. Augustine, I cannot approve the damnation of unregenerate children, nor in general damnation resulting from original sin alone. Nor can I believe that God condemns those who are without the necessary light. One may believe, with many theologians, that men receive more aid than we are aware of, 
were it only when they are at the point of death. It does not appear necessary either that all those who are saved should always be saved through a grace efficacious of itself, independently of circumstances. Also, I consider it unnecessary, if you're reading along with me, there's a typo there. Um, I consider it unnecessary to say that all the virtues of the pagans were false, or to say that all their actions were sins, though it be true that what does not spring from faith or from the uprightness of the soul before God is infected with sin at least virtually. Finally, I hold that God cannot act as if at random by an absolutely absolute decree or by a will independent of reasonable motives. And I am persuaded that he is always actuated in the dispensation of his grace by reasons wherein the nature of the objects participates. Uh, otherwise, he would not act in accordance with wisdom. I grant nevertheless that these reasons are not of necessity bound up with the good or the less evil natural qualities of men, as if God gave his grace only according to these good qualities. Yet I hold, as I have explained already here, that these qualities are taken into consideration like all the other circumstances, since nothing can be neglected in the designs of supreme wisdom. Okay, there are lots of things going on here, and so let me uh, unpack this a little bit. Leibniz here uh, disagrees with the dogma that unbaptized children or pagans are necessarily damned, but note the reasons given. Leibniz is objecting to the damnation of individuals that is solely due to original sin alone. And so he gives something like the following argument. If someone is corrupted by original sin but not actual sin, then they would not inevitably be subject to damnation. Unbaptized infants and virtuous pagans uh, are those people and so are not inevitably subject to damnation. The case for unbaptized infants is easier to make since presumably they are not capable of engaging in actual sin. But what about the pagans? The counter argument presented here by Leibniz is that the actions of pagans are sinful simply in virtue of being tainted by original sin. And so one might argue, without the grace of Jesus Christ to remedy the original sin, all actions of the pagans are actually sinful. And Leibniz's argument doesn't go through. There would be no salvation outside of the church. Leibniz replies, by denying that original sin infects the actions of the pagans, even pagans can be truly virtuous and act according to a good will. At best, we can say that their actions are virtually sinful, since they do not in originate in an attitude of faith. But this, according to his argument, would never be enough to guarantee their damnation. And so the conclusion results in a possibility of salvation, even for those who are independent of the Christian church. But let's step back from this uh, particular debate for a moment and ask a prior question. Why does Leibniz need to focus on the distinction between original sin and actual sin in the first place? Why not argue that the pagans could have been provided a private showing of grace at their death even if their actions were actually sinful? If what we're interested in is what God could do, then it seems that religion is easily universalizable. God could confer, confer the necessary grace on anyone at the time of their death. And is this enough to deny the claim that pagans are inevitably damned? The problem is in discovering why God would act in such a way. What reason would God have for conferring grace on a pagan who is not only uh, hobbled by original sin, but engaged in actual evil acts as well? The intuition isn't nearly as strong that God might confer grace on this individual rather than punishment for their evil actions. So the possibility of a virtuous pagan is for Leibniz the possibility that there are individuals whose actions serve as reasons for a particular distribution of grace. Uh, and so here, it, just to raise a question, I'm not sure how gratuitous uh, it is. It does, it seems in this passage, uh, take into consideration the nature of the individual. And so God's conferral of grace to the pagan would not be arbitrary or capricious. It would be reasonable and fitting given his wisdom and goodness. This is uh, further emphasized uh, in this uh, following section of the quotation. Here Leibniz argues, as Rutherford has noted, that grace should not be understood as a mysterious efficacious power independent of circumstances Rather, the circumstances are part of the grace that God confers. Here it seems to me Leibniz is carving out the doctrinal room in the context of a natural theology to make good on the claim that God could with reason provide salvation 
for those outside of the reach of the church. Leibniz wants 